First of all, thank you for being here. For me, it's an honor, honor to be here in, in London uh, talking and cooking about Mexico. I would like to, first of all, say that I'm not a... Um, I'm just a cook that loves herbs, but I'm not a herb specialist. So I would just share what I've done with herbs and, and what I've seen. But, you know, I don't have that much knowledge as, uh, as an academic of, of herbs. Um, I thought there were going to be much more English people, so I'm, I would talk about some very typical Mexican herbs that I never seen in Europe. And I was inspired about herbs because I lived in London for a while and I, I realized how much English people um, take, take herbs into, into their daily life and how herbs are so important for them. And that was really when I realized how lucky we are in Mexico because we have a really large um, number of herbs and we've into herbs since the Aztecs. And what I think it's really amazing is how herbs in cooking and in healing have passed all the way through our history. And uh, well, I just want to share that. So I'll talk a little bit about that history and then I'll concentrate on my thing which is food and herbs. Um, I, well, I don't know if you know, but there are two types of codices that just talk about herbs and how herbs cured many types of illness since a long time ago. But illness not just like headaches, illness such as uh, how to deal after a storm, un rayo, how are you saying? <laughs> A highlight gets into you what to do after, how to cure yourself after that. So it's really beautiful to, to look at those codices. This is Codice uh, Florentino. This was done by Fray Bernardino de Sagún. And here there's 755 type of herbs. And like you could see how they just did everything with herbs. Um, when I was living here in London, um, I was pregnant and I just took herbs like all the way through my pregnancy. And even when I was going to give birth, they give me this like Ruda tea just to make the, the working of the pregnancy much faster. So I went back to Mexico after that and I, I got really into into knowing more about herbs because at my father's, at my parents' house, we always had like te de bugambilia and you know, the normal typical herbs, no? But then I found out all these herbs you get in the markets and how most of the time the herbs are not with the vegetable side, but more in the healing side, always with the yerberos. For example, I found out here in Europe, how ortiga, it's used in soups, in risottos, just like a spinach. And then I remember how ortiga in Mexico is more like a niche plant that gets into your, your arm and it's really painful. And then I came to the markets, I asked for ortiga and they were like, are you bad of your kidneys or what you need ortiga for? And I st start to cook again, uh, like, like in Europe, with ortiga. And now, now, for example, I do an ortiga dish with some cabrito, which is nice. And what I love about herbs is just to think that herbs are uh, wild. Herbs are one of the most sustainable things. And there's like lots of things to, to work with them. And for me, cooking and Cooking is really important, of course, for pleasure, first of all, but then for yourself, how you feel after you eat, how food makes you just feel. And I think herbs can make you, first of all, distinguish one dish from the other in a very radical way. 
if you put a pasote to, the, to a meat, piece of meat and then you put hoja santa and then oregano, you will have another completely different experience. So that's why I think herbs are so like strong. And then what I think, and that's fascinating, it's how herbs can make you feel more light, digest better, and well, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I just start to, to talk about more about cooking, but these botanics are from other Codice, which is El Codice Cruz Badiano, and this was done in long, long time ago, uh, 1,575. And here, um, this guy, Martin de la Cruz, he just wrote about, like also, like many, many herbs. And apparently, <laughs> we have nowadays 4,000 herbs in general. And from those 4,000, 1,000 have like this curing, um, uh, side. And for me as a cook, it's like a, like a challenge to get together the healing and the cooking. Um, I don't think we need to use the herbs just for the sake of using them, but I think herbs can, can be used also as cooking, and it can give you like many, many surprises. Then in, in in the last century, uh, well, Humboldt, for example, did loads of searching on botanics in general, and also Jose Maria Velasco. And, you know, the Spaniards, when they arrived to Mexico, they were really amazed about the herbs. Sometimes they liked them, and sometimes they just thought it was like a crazy religious and they didn't like it that much. However, it persisted. And nowadays, it's like a, I don't think a war, but in, on the one side, with medicine, like the use of, with, not, with um, classical medicine, the use of herbs have been um, forgotten, in the, especially in the cities. But the good thing is that in the rural areas, herbs are still there. And I think nowadays with what's going on in Mexico and with the new generation that is really proud of, of what we have, we are all looking into new things, always trying to find out new flavors, new ideas. And for me, it was really amazing to find things like epazote that I seen in, in, in the markets, in, in the murals of Diego Rivera, for example, but then find out that the pasote, that it's a classical herb that we use in quesadillas, in esquites, in, in uh, frijoles. Um, you can use it, for example, in a very amazing dessert with guavas and chocolate. Like how this like herbic and really um, most of the time have acid there and loads of uh, especially aroma and flavor, and you can really get into it. And for me, it's just been like a really pleasurable um, thing to just to get the herbs out of, the, of our usual context, no? To really see in them an opportunity of getting more flavors and more, more things. For example, Loja Santa, which is, you know, a very beautiful herb and a really cheap herb and easy to grow. I think it's like really, or even much stronger than tarragon, which sometimes we buy and it's so expensive and it's so, we associate it with France, so we, we think it's really elegant. And then you see in Noja Santa this beautiful anise power, which I think we have to just, you know, make it, make it happen and make it, uh, approachable to the people. And um, in the restaurant, or in, in the restaurants of the city, and these restaurants where young people were trying to do like, like new things and new approaches to food, 
it's really amazing how when I've done, for example, an ice cream with Hoja Santa, uh, people find it boring or, or exciting, and some people don't even know what Hoja Santa is, but then some people get really excited, especially like old people that maybe got into Hoja Santa when they were young and then, you know, it was not used again. And it's been like a really nice experience for me. This is what I was saying that in the markets, sometimes these herbs, you, you find them more in the, with the herbolarios or more the, well, the people that cure with herbs and with the chamanes and all, all this side. And what I found really amazing is how a herb like papalo, for example, that it's so strong, it's always present with, with a very greasy meat, no? So it, it's not just for the sake of it. It's really for making your time much better after you have that piece of heavy meat. <coughs> and I just find that fascinating, honestly. This is a cedera, which in Mexico we have a lengua de vaca, which is really similar, which is really acidic. And it's the monte. And well, let's, it's also important because that's also like a line, which are herbs, which are quelites, which are what, which are wheats. But I think, and what I've noticed is, it's considered um, all, all the herbs are inside the Kelites family. So basically, Kelites are any plant, any weed that grows naturally, that we don't have to, to, um, to cultivate it, no? It just grows. And what happened is, for many years, all these herbs were seen as maleza, and they were taken out of the milpa, because they, they, they thought they were interfering with the other processes of growing. And that's a shame because in, in a, um, a leaf like, like chaya, it's much, much more um, healthier and much more full of minerals than spinach. And, you know, it grows just like, like a weed. It just doesn't stop. We do with chaya um, kind of a pesto. And what it's really amazing with chaya is that it doesn't get oxidized when you put uh, hot, hot water, hot uh, warm there. That usually with herbs, it happens. So what we do with chaya is whenever we want to do a sauce with herbs that will, we will know that with the heat will get black, we put chaya there and it stays much more greener for a longer time. So that's a very nice, nice thing about chaya. Oregano yucateco, well we have like 15 types of oregano. This one in particular that I bought today is really special because it's really thick and it's strong, but it's also citrusy. And what we've done is just, we do like a tempura and we fry this. And then, you know, you just bite a piece of, of this and it's, it's really amazing. Pipicha, which is strong, usually paired with with, you know, heavy meat. Mastuerzo, which is funny because many of us cooks uh, new mastuerzo in Europe because, you know, many people started using it. And mastuerzo in Mexico, it's, you know, especially in Oaxaca, it just grows in, in the street. Flor de isote, that's other thing, but it's just how, you know, the biodiversity that we have that it's amazing. Papalo, hoja de aguacate, which is also used with, with beans usually, but you can do whatever you want with that. Quintoniles, also really, really healthy and really sustainable food. So I think it's really a good idea to, to have an eye on this so easily <coughs> herbs that grow and that they have so much power and for me, these type of herbs, because they are so unique, really 
you can relate them to like Mexican soil. Like for me, epazote reminds me straight away to, to the markets, to, to Oaxaca. And I believe for a guy or a person from London, it would be really amazing to get that association. Because of course we have cilantro and we have other herbs, but I think herbs like epazote o jacanta and this type of oregano are completely unique. Wasontle, or that's in, in, the, in the same group. You know, here epazote with the esquites and with the classic quesadilla, hoja santa. <laughs> hoja santa usually it's used to fill meat or, or um, fish, and usually in tamales. But, you know, hoja santa with sugar, for me, it's just amazing. We do in the bakery also bread with, with herbs, and it's really surprising as well. It's just like sugar and, and, and herbs are a really good match. Ortiga, this is the pasta we do with Ortiga. This is the ice cream we do with Oja Santa that here are paired with, with guavas, but we've also paired with figs. And the, you know, the anise seed of, of Oja Santa with fruit it's just like a really nice. And this is Chico Zapote with Oja Santa and pink peppercorn that you're going to taste that today. That's our last dish uh, with Oja Santa. Sometimes I think we as cooks get, like we find a flavor and it's just really exciting. So we keep doing and using the same flavor. Um, this is oysters with just more herbs sardines with more herbs. This is a pasta that we put the epazote between the two sheets of pasta, so it's just beautiful, and then it cuts the richness of the, of the cheek, because what looks there, it's, it's pig's cheek. This is a rosemary bun. This is a tarragon bun. And this is a dessert that's done with loads of herbs, and it really helps after you have a five or six um, courses, no? So this is like a tisane. Instead of having a tisane, you can have a, like a dessert full of herbs and olive oil, and then we do a rosemary, rosemary ice cream. And it really helps you to digest, and it's really delicious. So I'm very happy to, to deal with that. Um, I am planning to do just like a... a like a tasting, because infusions of herbs are also really amazing. It's just completely different. So I can pass this to try it um, by itself, or better to try it first in tisane, so you can, yeah, you can pass it by. I don't know if you have uh, any questions I, I could answer. No, not at all. <laughs> I brought them in the in the luggage. <laughs> I wasn't supposed, but you know, <laughs> it, you know, it's very difficult to talk about Mexican herbs and then bring an epazote from. I mean, bring a cilantro from Thailand. I mean, in London, it's amazing because you find things of all over the world but never a pasote and never, never hoja santa. <coughs> and you know, I thought there were going to be more English people here. But <laughs> yes. Yes. In, in which side, like in the healing side or in the cooking side? Okay, actually, it's, it's really, I like your question because there are many books related like to heal, like herbs and healing, but there are not so many about cooking. And what I, I recommend is you get like a, there's a book called The Yoga of Herbs. And that one is really nice because 
although it's all about healing, it relates like one herb with the other. And in that way, you can get like ideas to cook. But in general, for example, um, Oja Santa is in, in the anise side. So anything you associate with fennel, with tarragon, with anise is in that way. Uh, epazote, I think there's nothing like similar to epazote. Epazote is a really particular herb. Oregano, like marjoram, more, you know, more um, resinous herbs. But for me, the best is to try, because I never seen, for example, epazote in the sweet side, never ever. And then when we tasted it, I was like super blown away, no? And it all started with tarragon, like tarragon, because, you know, tarragon and chocolate, like French have done that for many years. So we started to, to taste the herbs with chocolate and then we thought that with uh, Hoja Santa it's amazing. So I think the best thing is always to try. Uh, I love also the, the mix of fruit, very sweet fruit, with very sharp uh, herbs, because it like cuts through. Like, it's like the dish we're doing today, although it's Chico Zapote and it's really, really sweet. With the Hoja Santa, you can turn it into the savory side. Um, well, it's, it's funny, you know, because now it's these limits that it can be either a dessert in a very herbal way, or it can be a starter in a fruity herbal. And I like to, to, to reach those limits, like to, for me it's amazing to start a meal with a very digestive way, the same as if you would take a, a salad, or to end the meal also like that. But I think the best is just to try. Because the classic is with uh, very fatty uh, meats, uh, or with fish, or you know, with corn. But I think you can do like much many things. <laughs> but answering your question, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a book that is published by, by UNAM, which is called Quelites en la Mesa, which I think is beautiful. But all these books come and then no one prints them again and they're di very difficult to get. So we have to do something with, with herbs. In... You're welcome. For example, the pasote tea is not really used, no? A pasote is not used in teas. Any more questions? like that much about putting water and then the herbs. I think that um, soaks too much water and then it damps and then they collapse. For me, the best way is to just like a, like a, a cloth, a J cloth, put, make it humid and then just uh, cover, cover and, and keep changing that, the cloth. And it's what I think it's really amazing is when you have a herb that comes from a good soil, it lasts long, a lot, especially when it's uh, naturally grown. When it's produced, it just, in, in, one, in one day, it, it, it goes away. And for example, in epazote, usually the smaller the epazote, it's much better because that means it's like a, in the natural grown, like more in the weed 
when it's these huge, beautiful leaves, usually they are produced. So that's a good way to, to distinguish. And what I also really like is to buy the herbs to the very old woman that, you know, they're on their floor with the herbs from their little garden. That's the best. And I really like to talk with these women because I think through the women, these herbs have persisted because they use it in their houses, they use it in the houses they work for, and they use it a lot in, in, as medicines. You know, they cannot afford to go and get all these very expensive medicines, and, and they still really believe in that. So I, I love just to talk to them and see what they, how they use that for. I think that's the best knowledge. Epazote, it's digestive, but it's more uh, antibacterial. It's more digestive of Hasanta, for example. I mean, herbs in general are digestive, but Epazote has this like very good property about being anti antibacterial. Anti mm. Pipicha? It's the opposite, I mean, because they are too strong. They persist all the way, and uh, they persist and. Uh, the yes, you are. You remember it all day, and that's why many people don't like it. But it's really digestive. Like all this thing about. Uh, because it's the opposite. No, no, no. It is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I know because you keep it like remembering it all day long. Yes, but it is. Have you tasted pipicha? Many people don't like it because you take like a leaf and then all day long the flavor comes and comes and comes and comes. So it's like a little bit uh, nasty, but it's like if you pair it like with a very fatty, usually it's paired always with a fatty meat. It's like it's like a, um, uh, like a vacuna, no? Okay, I give you some hoja santa. What it's amazing is, apart from the digestive side and all the curing side, it's how they're full of minerals and how they just grow. And I think we have to take a look a lot more into the things that don't require water and don't require uh, all these things that's going on with, uh, with the planet, no? Like if you, you need so much water to produce a gram of meat and then, you know, you eat chaya and it's almost as healthy, I mean, it has, I think, more minerals than meat. Chaya is really, really healthy, really, really healthy. So I think we have to look at herbs much more, I mean, to give them more value because they, I think in, in Mexico that we have this um, huge problem about food and about seguridad alimentaria. And I believe in herbs, in insects, in mushrooms, we have like a really huge opportunity there that we haven't been conscious about, no? We, we have to stop eating so much meat and producing, forcing so much nature when nature is giving us. You don't even have to take care of this and it just grows and grows and grows. And then just people, some people think it's basura or maleza and they just put it away, like quelites. Quelites are so nutritious. And they, Uh huh. Bad, no? No, it's like like with la coche. It's the same. It's like before with la coche was in 
well, it's a fungus, there it's, you know, corn, and then suddenly in the 70s, I, I, a politician, the, the wife of a politician, made this very amazing dinner with Huitlacoche in Los Pinos, and after that, Huitlacoche, and I think we have an area of opportunity, like, huge in those kinds of, of, of things, no? And that's why I just think it's, like, really amazing. Okay. Flor de calabaza, chayote. Sure. Yes. If you see the menu, the well, we will we, we'll, we start with pork, then with mushrooms, wild mushrooms, but in an escabeche side, which is like you know tangy. And then after me comes the dashi with the abulon, and then the lobster. So the um, chico sapote with the pink pepper and the uh, hoja santa there, it's like a break, it's like a cleaner, it's like a clean palate cleaner, I mean. And I think it's a way to just make your stomach like to rest and also your palate, like to in between. It's, it's a little bit uh, contrasting, but I think it works really well. But you let it's going to be yes. You start with light, no? Yes. Well, these are pig trotters, but they're in the vinegary side, which is also good to start uh, like a meal because all your senses start to wake up. And I think, and I'm I'm happy that you touch this. We just need to take our, out our boundaries about how it has to be done, no? Why first the white wine or why first the light side? I think like many of the f Europeans, they have their salad at the end. And for me, that makes sense because you digest, no? And, and it's just, you know, sometimes we just follow things. But I don't know, let you let me know if you like it this way. I think it's good because it just breaks between the vinegary side and then the more fishy side. So this is like a middle, what you'll see. Mm -hmm.